Good evening, and uh, welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, and to the seventh season of the Orders and Lecture Series, and indeed to our final lecture of the series. Uh, I am Karen Taylor, uh, Program Director of the General Society. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Council Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the Friends of the Artisan Lecture Series. I would also like to thank the New York Landmarks Conservancy for their assistance in promoting tonight's event. And finally, I would like to express our appreciation to Thomas Donahue, our window curator, who has an installed and designed 24 different window installations for this season, for lectures including tonight's talk. And I hope you will have a look at the windows before you leave. Uh, the General Society was founded in 1785, 232 years ago. It was founded by the skills craftsmen of New York City. These included, in fact, were tw um, 22 artisans who represented the different trades. Some of these trades included carpenters, blacksmiths, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, our organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, our Locke Museum, which is upstairs, the General Society Library, and our nearly 200-year-old lecture series of which tonight's lecture is part of. You will find additional information on a blue and white postcard at the front of the room. Tonight, we gather once more to pay tribute to the art of craftsmanship. The Artisan Lecture Series has committed itself to giving voice to internationally known artisans who will talk about the intricacies of their specialized crafts. The mission of the Artisan Lecture Series is to promote the work and art of skilled craftsmen to assist ensuring their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for future generations. The Artisan Lecture Series is co-curated by Rhett Butler, owner and founder of E.R. Butler, and John Weart, master artisan of fine ornamental metalwork metal and the original creator of the Artisan Lecture Series. I'm so pleased that our speakers this evening are Vincent Leo and Eve Tinnis of TRM, TRM Enterprises, who are both slate tile, and stone roofing master artisans. TR Enterprises was founded by Vincent Leo, uh, who was inspired by the artisan tradition of his hometown, Rouen, where he trained in France as a tinsmith and slate roof artisan. In 1980, tools in hand and keen to continue his craft, he came to the United States. Over the years, his company has grown steadily, as young trainees have become skilled craftsmen and other artisans who share the company's ethos and commitment to beauty and quality work have joined TRM Enterprises. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Vincent Leo and Eve Tinnis. And I think Vincent's going to speak first. Thank you very much for this introduction and uh, good evening, everyone. It's, it's a real honor to be here and uh, to speak to you. And I appreciate so much what I just heard that you said, uh, because that is the very reason why we're here. Like, and I am touched by your presence here, which tells me that you have an interest in what we do in this trade, that uh, several trades, actually, that we're about to present to you. So, a little bit about me and what maybe my qualifications are to speak to you. Well, some of it was just mentioned. You can hear from my accent, so I'm Vincent Liu. I was born in France, never lost the accent. I came here now 37 years ago, so I, I'm actually, I spent more time in the USA than in France at this point. So I'm, a, I'm an American citizen 
more, almost more than I'm a French citizen, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. Um, more, my qualification to speak to you is that I've been doing this work for 45 years now, and that is, uh, it started, so it started in France, and yes, I was moved by being born and raised in the city of Rouen, a, a beautiful city, full of historical monuments. Uh, some of you may know the cathedral, was painted by Claude Monet, and this well-known cathedral had uh, for a while the highest steeple in Europe. Uh, they didn't last too long, but it was the highest building. I don't want to say for the world, it may have been in the world for a few months, okay? But uh, this cathedral really is, is uh, part of who I am, I would say. And yes, it inspired me to get involved in the building trades. So, um, I learned, so I went to a school, trade school in France, then I worked in France for, for a while, and uh, it was my intention to start a business in France. Uh, I was married, I had met a young American lady, and uh, we got married, I had a child, and she was an only child, so the story is that after her parents visited, we, I felt, I could see they were really sad, and uh, the right thing felt to go back to the States. And so I, instead of starting a business in France, I started the business in the States. The connection, we end up in the village of Sack Harbor in the Hamptons on the East End. There was a family on my wife's uh, mother's side. There was a little summer bungalow, and it had a teeny, uh, not a garage, more like a little barn with it. And we got there, I started the business from there. So it wasn't like uh, Bill Gates starting Microsoft in, uh, you know, in his garage. It was, uh, little artisan starting a much smaller business. But, uh, you know, the years grew, I had children and uh, did the business and it grew into what it is today, not still a very small business, but very specialized and uh, doing very interesting work. And I'm very fortunate that the business has grown and been uh, with the addition of wonderful artisans. Some came from Europe, just like me. Uh, the, the, what I've done, so you'll see some of the projects we're going to present. Some were complicated. I had been training people, but uh, there was too much to do, and I felt that I needed uh, additional help. I, I went to a resource that we have in France, which is the Guild, and you, I think some other artisans may have spoken to you about this. But I was able to uh, bring trainee and skilled people from France, fully legal, with a visa for, for a short time. And what happened, some of them actually met some nice American lady instead. So here we are now, uh, some of them are here. There are four of us in a company who manage the company and we are training and have people working with us. So we're gonna be presenting you some of this work. Um, maybe a couple remarks about the trade. Okay, our trade, as you, as you said, is uh, we specialize in slate, tile, stone as well, although stone is rare here, but we'll say a few words about that. And of course, all aspects of architectural sheet metal work. You're here in New York, you can see copper work everywhere. So. We do that. We were trained as, a, well, French, in France, we're trained, we work with zinc more than copper. Um, the work is the same, the, the, although there are, of course, differences. Working with zinc, you have to be more careful with the, the expansion and contraction of the metal. Uh, copper is a more forgiving metal for that, but I would say otherwise it, it is sheet metal and the basics of the of fabrication are very much the same. 
you know, all the, all the roofs in Paris and all the monuments and all the ornamentation is in zinc. So the zinc weathers in gray instead of the copper in uh, green. Here we have a lot of uh, work done in lead-coated copper, which turns in, in gray, remains gray. Um, what I wanted to say, so, yeah, the, the roofing trade, you know, we're doing artisans roofing, so slate roof, tile, metal work. But it's also uh, roofer, roofing is a trade by itself in a way. I found out quickly that when you, come, when you are in the US of A, when you are in America, and someone asks you, what do you do? And you say, I'm a roofer. It doesn't work that well. Like, you're not well considered. It refer, roofer means more, uh, you think of someone, it's a caricature, but you think of someone, young lad with a pickup truck, a bucket of tar, and a trowel, pretty much. So, and you know, we come, copper smith, tin smith, and for us, we have a completely different idea of what a, of what a roofer is. But the word roofer in French is couvreur, which really, if I translate, it's coverer. We cover us. We cover the roof with different materials. That's what we do. Yes, why do we know about slate, tile, and stone? That's, those are the materials used in France. Different region have different materials, but that's why we're familiar with them. There are many more. I don't know if you can think of them. I, I, yesterday I was uh, preparing. I tried to make a list of all the, all the roofing material used on the planet. Can you think of some of them with me? I'll, I'll give you my list. But uh, OK, so we have slate, tile, metal, all kinds of metal. Now, if I start listing them, uh, well, I'll tell you, copper, zinc, lead, do a lot of lead work in France, cathedrals, a lot of cathedrals have lead roofs. Monel Metal here, Trinity Church at Wall Street, uh, I think the um, station, uh, not Penn Station, the other ones, um, Grand Central used to have a Monel Metal roof. Very good roof, long lasting, like hard to beat that. Uh, bronze, just did a bronze roof in California actually. Aluminum, steel, stainless steel, titanium, and uh, tin of course, and you know, gold. Gold has been used as a roofing materials as well, not too many these days. I didn't put silver because I've never heard of a roof covered in silver, but that could be. Now there's plenty of other materials. All right, maybe it's hard to interact, but I have, uh, this is what I have. Tree bark, so wood, different kinds of wood, right, split. Cedar, uh, French, we have melaise, uh, chestnut, you know, old wood that splits well. Tree bark in Japan, special bark of special trees are used for roofing. Bamboos. Palms, all kinds of palms. Um, dirt, soil with plantings on it. Straws, actually, I come from Normandy. Uh, lots of straw roofs still using um, either barley or reeds. And of course, the more uh, modern material, uh, you know, all well, modern. I, was, I, I wrote bituminous coating. Some, some society where there was some uh, uh, asphalt coming at the surface used this to waterproof their dwelling. Fabric, tents, nomad. And, uh, and then of course asphalt shingles, rubber, plastics, and uh, you know, all kinds of material I may be missing. Why am I going over this? It's to tell you that a roofer is someone who's able to apply what, any one of these materials in a way that, that creates a waterproof dwelling space. That's what a roofer is. So the trade of roofing is 
not only knowing how to use the material, but it's understanding how water works. How does the water travel? How does it stay? Capillarity, what does it do? Because you think you've got it right, the water runs. Well, capillarity retains the water. Then the wind pushes it. And so each material has different ways to be applied that will help you or that will cause leaks inside the building. So that's the roofing trade. So we're a long way from the pickup truck with a bucket of tar. Um, you know what, I need to have a, sorry, just to. I think that's, a, that's about it for my introduction. Uh, I wanted you to understand that, yes. The, 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 the understanding of water and affinity with water, how water travels, and, uh, and now we're going to come how, how it applies to the work that we do. Maybe just a very quick word on where do we work? You know, slate, tile, metal, where do we find these, uh, these roofs? Mostly public buildings, churches, cathedrals, schools, university, libraries, national palaces, monuments, sometimes hospitals, museums. And, you know, a lot of these buildings have become landmarks or historical monuments in Europe, and they are becoming here. And also, we've worked, and for me, in the Hamptons, where I started the company, you know, the, the high end of the residential uh, market also, you know, people that have the means to build mansions often use these materials. So, and that's, that's where I started the company. It was unknown to me when I came from France. I had no idea. I ended up in Sac Harbor and, oh my, there was all these uh, buildings with slate, a lot of them with the uh, cedar roofs, but still a lot of slate, tile and copper. And, uh, you know, it worked out. I was busy for many, many years and raised a fairly large family, six kids. <laughs> and, uh, you know, still at it today. So um, I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Yves Tunis, who will present you a project that we've done in the city. I'll, Yves, I want to say, I had something written to introduce Eve, but you did it very well. And which is, uh, Eve to me is a true craftsman, skilled in the applications of a variety of roofing materials and a very successful project manager for our company. Eve has been with us, uh, with TRM for more than 13 years. He's heading our New York City department or and uh, he's, he's completed successfully a wide range of really challenging projects. So, Yves, your turn. Hello everyone, I'm very honored to be here today at the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. My name is Yves Turnus, New York City Branch Manager for TRM Enterprises. As Vincent told you, TRM Enterprises is a company which specializes in slate, tile and stone applications as a roofing material and on all phases of architectural sheet metal work. The project I am about to show you is the Cook House at 973 Fifth Avenue. This townhouse was designed by Stanford White and completed in 1907. The roof consists of custom glazed interlocking tiles and copper cladded dormers. The tiles were fabricated by Luigi Tile Company, located in New Lexington, Ohio, east of Columbus. The Luigi Company 
was a tile manufacturer of choice back then in the Gilded Age, and many landmarks today still have Ludovici tiles on their roofs. Next slide shows the condition of the roof when we started probing in 2014. Most of the tiles covered in roofing cement and the copper cladding corroded bright green over the years. This townhouse registered as a landmark called for a complete, a complete restoration to its original design. Tiles in this condition are not salvable to roofing cement, a preferred repair method does no good for tile roofs, as you can see. The copper cladding of dormers gets thinner and thinner over the years as it weathers, and after 100 years plus, as in this project, cannot be salvaged or restored and needs a complete replacement. Next slide shows the reproduction of a dormer cladding fabricated and put together at our shops. The material, copper sheet metal, is the same material as used in 1907. Copper has been used in construction for hundreds of years and with today's technology and machinery, the quality only improved. The longevity of a copper installation depends on its thickness, assembly techniques, and the skill level of the craftsmen who do the installation. Longevity of 75 to 100 year plus is expected. Next slide shows installation of the tile and its waterproof connection to the dormers. The shiny copper will weather brown within a few weeks and eventually green. The green patina process can take 20 years plus, depending on the environment. <clears throat> the glazed tile will keep its appearance and colors for many years to come. I'd like to point out again that no matter the quality of the chosen roofing materials, the skills of the craftsman defines the longevity of the roof as well as its aesthetic appearance. Having had training in craftsman schools in Europe myself and realizing the scare equivalent in the States, I was very delighted to hear about the existence of the General Society. This school has been providing training to individuals to further their skills and knowledge in construction trades for 232 years. Chapeau and bond continuation. The construction industry needs you more than ever. Last slide to conclude, to conclude this project. Here we see the street view of 973 and its neighbor at 972. Nine seven two at the right is called the Whitney House, also designed by Stanford White. Interesting anecdote is that these two projects, almost built at the same time, were some of Stanford White's last projects, and he never saw their completions, as he tragically got shot in 1906. Note that the tile roof on the Whitney House has been replaced at some point with a tile roof that is not matching the original Ludovici tile and probably not the original color either. With today's more vigilant Landmarks Preservation Commission, landmark restorations are done better, respecting the original design, thus preserving, preserving New York City architectural history. I'll
hand it over to Vincent again. Thank you, Yves. So now my turn to present you, sorry, wrong. Ah, we're moving to slate and stone roof and with copper accessories. All right, a quick, let's go to the first one. Maycross, this is a project that we've done a few years ago now in Sac Harbor. Uh, I think this house is uh, registered, and uh, oops. yeah, this is called Maycroft. And I remember this used to belong to, I want to say the Episcopal Church. It was built by some wealthy entrepreneur back in the days, um, and then it was it be, it it belonged to the. I think Episcopal Church to an order. And my children, when I was, uh, when they were young, actually went to the school. And I was, I remember picking them up or dropping them and thinking, oh, that would be a nice project to do. Deserve a slate roof. And, uh, and it took many, many years, decades. Uh, the house was sold eventually, the church had to let it go, was bought back by some wealthy individual who decided for a complete restoration and there was a, a slate roof originally and they decided to go for it and we had a shot at uh, bidding for it and we won the, the contract. So it, it's, you know, the house is kind of a funny house but for me it was a great job and I'll, the picture will show you some of the details that are interesting. All right, some of the slates from near. Now, you know, I have no idea if any of you have seen slates from close or, the, or just from, uh, I mean, in New York, there are plenty of slates on the roofs, but they're pretty hard, they're pretty far away. But that's what a slate from uh, close looks like. And, uh, you know, they vary in thickness and sizes and depending on the, what the architect specs really. Um, the thicker the slates, the more um, character in a way. I mean, it depends. The French slates are very thin actually, and that's a different type of character. But uh, in this application, those were the slates. And I put that picture to give you a sense of what a slate roof, what a, that's what a job looks like while it's being done. Uh, now, you know, this, this machine is a big help now. For most of my life, I never had that. And let me tell you, my back suffers today. When I started in France, and some of my colleagues can attest to that, we, we carry those sleigh that you saw, we carry them on our shoulder and climb on the ladder with a sleigh on top. And that was uh, hard work, and uh, I can still feel it. So now we have more modern ways to do that, and it's a lot better. Um, so, okay, let's move on. So uh, completed, this section is completed. You see some of the detail. Um, I would point out, look at the way the hips come together here, and here, and here. Now this is the French way to work these hips with the slate. The slate is a material that allows you to do that. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but if it's, there's a way to do them, you weave them back and forth, as you can do with wood shingle, which you may be more familiar with, at least if you go in the Hamptons, where there are a lot of them. But what the French don't do, it's more done in uh, Holland, maybe Germany, they had a cap on the, on the hips, which gives a more heavy appearance. I personally, not... I am biased for the French way. It's uh, also, it's a little bit more skilled in the way that it's done because you really need to keep that line and not go away. Uh, there's no correction. Um, 
Okay, from close. So that's it's, it's clean work, as you can see. And then some of the copper work. Um, sorry. Finials, so that we do that also, since we were trained as a tinsmith, coppersmith. And uh, the architect usually comes up with a design and we, we fabricate it. This is a detail of, uh, of uh, uh, this would be the, maybe a very small window or it could be a ventilation for the roof. Uh, in French, we call these uh, queue d'aron. So you can see there's a, it's a, oops, sorry. It's, it's a, a pretty way to tie up different, uh, different uh, surfaces of the roof together. Um, this is the carriage house for this uh, house, so you can see it's a, it's a nice estate. Uh, it had, uh, they restored the, the fountain, the windmill. Uh, it was all really nicely done. I mean, they definitely spared no expense and did it the original way, as anyone would wish. Uh, it was a, a very nice restoration. Okay, moving on to another project, kind of a funny one. This one is in North Haven, and uh, it's a funny house that had all kind of weird to uh, not saying this is my favorite house or anything, but in terms of the slate trade, it's, it's, it was a very challenging work, and you're gonna see why. So there's all kind of curves, you can see that. It was a three-colored slate, not our choice, that was the owner. Uh, Vermont slate, um, one size, uh, different width. Uh, pretty thick, you'll see. And uh, some closer detail. And now, this is not our work. This is the reason why we were called to work on this house. Okay, that was the whoever, the contractor who did the original roof, that's what they did. It takes skills when you, you know, the slate, they don't bend. That's a problem. So they try hard to make them work, but unless you've been trained and you have a sense of the material, it's difficult. So that, that roof leaked everywhere. So it took a while for the owner to decide. We, you know, we're for us, uh, the stories, we gave a price, of course, it was too much. We said it's a difficult roof to do. I mean, you know, and, but it, I think a couple of years later, we were called and we did get the contract and did the roof. So pretty much the same picture um, completed. So it gives you a sense, I mean, we're, we're, this is craftsmanship and we're done with a heart to do it properly. And uh, the job was successful. It's, we, we did that at least, I'd say 15 years ago, no leak, never. And actually I think we got a call to redo, they're always doing something there. So quickly, let's move on. The, so some of the copper work done, you know, terraces, or not, no big deal, but trying to keep a clean line and uh, again, skilled work to, to make this work and blend in. Uh, we do, as a company, we also do the waterproofing. Remember I was telling you about water. Doing a slate on the tile, I found that quickly, that it's not enough. If you're gonna do large project, you need to you need to do everything so that you can give a warranty and, uh, and the people trust you. So, you know, we, we, I learned we weren't trained to do that, but you, you, you can get factory training for different uh, waterproofing system, contemporary. So we work with rubber, with uh, plastic, and because uh, usually those are the waterproofing system used under this, this type of work for terraces. Older days would have been hot tar, pitch tar. Uh, in France, in Europe, flat roofs, older days, well, there were very few flat roofs, and the flat roofs would be done with lead. Uh, here, they can be done also with copper. But different matter. Let's move on. Private residence science point. Okay, another interesting job for me, which really is the job that 
that uh, caused me to really look for skilled help outside. Even though I had trained people, the job was large enough that I, I just needed additional help. Here we, so look, at, I love this picture. It was taken from a plane. So busy, busy work site, right? Looks like a big mess. But uh, you can see the work. So this is all slate work, and you'll see the house completed. It started with this one and moved to this one, finished by this one. A lot of copper work on this house, not just slate. These are copper dormer, copper, copper. All these are copper as well, copper turrets. I mean, lots of copper, tons of it. That's the house completed. It's uh, on the. So this was done in the year two, 1999. So that's that's a while. And last year, if you were you completed the restoration of the Sands Point Lighthouse, registered. Uh, landmarked, and uh, that was successfully completed by Eve last year. So that was not, you can see, there's a, there's a missing element here, which we did replace the entire thing, right, if I recall. But, uh, so it's all slate and copper. Moving on from closer, this particular roof is called a graduated roof. So, you start with large slate at the bottom and end up with small slate at the top. Why it's a style? Where did it come from? Well, originally, um, this is what I was told, I remember by my uh, instructor at school, but when the, the slates in, uh, in older days were gathered in the fields in France and they were heavy, you would gather you know, the heavier one and put them on the roof. And then as you go up the roof, it gets lighter, you put the smaller slate. So that's how the style came. And then now it's a style to the graduated roof from large to small. Uh, here would be about uh, 20 inch at the bottom and the slate at the top would be about uh, probably down to 12 inch. Different, different width, different thickness, and uh, it's a pretty roof. A lot of copper work on the dormers. Uh, Eve will address the copper work, so I'm not staying there, but gives you a sense, look, copper dormers, sorry, on the top as well. Dormer here, dormer there. Plenty of copper work, and that's why I was telling you, I realized I could not handle the job all by myself, and, and even the help I had was not enough. So I called, uh, I called people trained in France with, through the guild training, and they were able to pick up and give me assistance. And that's, that's, uh, I, that was really a good move on my part, I have to say. Because, uh, so here is uh, some of the slate work, you know, getting to the top of one of the turret. Notice, sorry, notice detail, like, uh, you know, we learned that it's, it's hard to do those uh, valleys. It's called a valley where, where the, the round, it is rounded, comes to a flat. Um, it all requires, it's, it's tricky work. Then that's a completed part, not the best picture, but the same area that this uh, um, fellow was working, and now it is complete with finials and all, to give you a sense. A little detail on one of the buildings in the past. That came from Normandy, not far from where I come from. That was a detail that uh, the owner wished to have. That's, in case you're a little warm, I figured I'd put that picture, but that's, you know, it's a little, it, you could say it's a little Disney World-like, yes it is, that was the taste, but in terms of work, uh, for me, and for us as a company, to use our skills, this was a wonderful job. Because they really, they, they, they let us do the work the way we had learned, and it was a very pleasant experience. And that doesn't look like it. It's a teeny little birdhouse. The slates are about that big. 
you can look at the, it's, it's a railing, and uh, I don't know why I put that one, because I love this little bird house. And now I'm back to Eve, who's going to tell you about metalwork, sheet metalwork. Next project shows copper sheet metal used as uh, the primarily roofing material using the standing seam system. We will also discuss restoration of ornamental copper work. The St. Augustine Church in Brooklyn, built in 1897, had originally a tile roof. After enduring 118 years of the elements of nature and countless repairs, a, a new roof was needed. A copper standing seam roof was chosen. Being a lighter roofing system than clay tiles, but with a compatible life expectancy. The standing seam system has been in use for hundreds of years and is still today one of the most waterproof systems for steep and low pitch roofs. Standing seam is basically sheets of metal with the sides folded at a 90 degree angle, folded over twice, creating an interlocking seam with concealed fasteners. The two basic fasteners are the fixed fastener and the expansion fastener. The fixed fastener is typically used for short panels and the ex expansion fastener is used for long panels to allow the panels to expand and retract with the different temperatures during the day and the seasons. In the northeast, copper panels can easily heat up to over 120 degrees and in the summer, a negative 10 degrees in the winter. Understanding and implementing the design of a roofing system that allows expansion are key to have a roof that will perform flawlessly for many decades. The same principle for gutter work. Long gutters with all the fabricated pieces soldered together soldered about every eight feet. Long gutters with all the fabricated pieces soldered together float on a substrate. Expansion joints will allow the gutter to expand and retract without building up stress. Stress that often leads to cracked seams, which can cause significant leaks, as we can see, as we can see in, in this picture. Uh, to clarify, this is not our work, but it, it, it shows the lack of um, expansion. The craftsman level of skills and technique should match the material one is working with. It can take several years of training and experience to get there. And I believe it also takes passion and desire to be part of a team. A team that is dedicated from start to end. A project takes leadership and vision, but also apprentices eager to learn and mechanics of all levels. All too, this is easier said than done. Having worked in France, Germany, 
Luxembourg for several years on historical buildings, working alongside craftsmen, augmented by classroom and workshop training, one st starts to take it for granted. But nothing was less true when I started working in the US. And should I mention the multiple languages, the cultural difference of our crew members? Yes, we do sometimes think we are in the middle of building another Tower of Babel. Nevertheless, this creates also a rich learning environment, setting up training programs and having exchanges with students from overseas craft schools who at their turn go back home with an American experience. Here we see the original finial reinstalled. We were able to remove the finial from the turret peak and take it down to our shop. Bad parts replaced, broken seams resoldered. A patina is applied to give it a uniform appearance. Here we see the statue of the angel Gabriel, missing his trumpet and not being in the best shape. <laughs> the statue was taken down and brought to the shop for an investigation. An investigation to determine if the statue could be saved. We felt brave enough to tackle the job, endless hours of cleaning, resoldering and replacing bad parts. Replacing the head was a project on its own. But eventually, Gabriel was ready to be hoisted up and reinstalled with trumpet and all to his original spot where he was for over a hundred years and will stay for many, many more to come. So. We have one last project to present. I hope this is not too long. Are you, are everyone okay? Um, this I'll try to be quick. This project was a really an exciting project. Like, you know, the kind of project you, that doesn't come very often. That was the, that's a project, it's a, a manor in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. We call it the Round Hill Estate. And so that was one of the elevation. You know, the first time I got the, the, the email with the plans, and I said, oh, that looks like an interesting project. It's a, so it's an existing uh, project. The house is also registered. It was built by Hirschfeld, was, I think, a pretty well-known uh, award-winning architect. It was built in 1939, right on, the, yeah, right on the onset of the Second World War which I guess here was not really that significant uh, until more later on. So obviously large homes were still being built. And uh, the first thing, so we asked, the roof is bad, we have to deal with the roof. <clears throat> the first thing to do is to find a tile that matches. Um, so that's why I put that in because actually these were samples, it's, it's difficult to find. It's a real challenge. The owner wanted the, t the tile, he didn't want a new roof. He wanted a new roof, he needed a new roof, but he wanted a roof that looked 100 years old. So we had to come up with the right tile. And it took a while, but we, we found it, you'll see. So in the process, like I say, this was the first poor match of a tile. You can see right here, 
it's a little yellow, it just didn't work. The, the picture before was that part here, and that ended up being the right match. You can see there is a biological growth right there, where the new tiles were applied, you don't have that growth anymore. That's, but it's still, I think you can see from the picture, it's a pretty good match. So, after that, so it's agreed, the owner agreed, the tile ended up to the manufacturer. We did, we, we got, uh, you heard Eve talk about Ludovici. Ludovici offered a tile. It was very, very expensive, and uh, it was not a perfect match. We end up with the, with the tile that was manufactured in Turkey, and, uh, and I, had, I had to go a couple times over there, and you'll see the process. So I put that because the first thing, actually this is new roof being applied, but the first thing to do in the job is take, so we found the tile, the tile comes, we have to take the old tile off. So that's how we did it with the, the help of the machine. This here actually is in Turkey. We had, this is a, uh, so it's a flat tile, right, clay tile, flat tile, British type, where a lot of fittings, you see all this, all this uh, hip tile, are, are, they're made in molds and they're fabricated in the factory. It's very, on the, on the project of this scope, there are many different uh, slope in the roofs, many different dormers, different area. It's, and each one has to be correct. And the challenge is it, there's nothing can fit. It has to be done uh, properly. So we, we, the only way to do this was to recreate each slope. And that's what these models are. Uh, take the old tile and ship them to Turkey. And uh, so that they could fabricate the proper tiles. So it, it took a lot of time to number, write what they were, write the area, and, uh, and go to Turkey. I went over there and, uh, with, with some help and we, we rebuilt the, what we needed and uh, they fabricated the tile. These were at the tile factory, that's uh, how they cook it. Tiles are put in there, the, there's a heat that goes through the holes on the right. From there, all these holes. These areas there, that's where you bring the tiles in. Gets closed up with mud, uh, bricks and mud, and then the tiles are baked. Of course, in the tile roof business, a very important uh, factor is to make sure when the tile come in an area like ours that they are, they are not affected by the frost. Okay, that is really important. You can get uh, cheap imports from China or they, they don't care. Your tile after uh, two winters, they'll be crumbling in pieces and many people get caught. But uh, properly tiled, the Turks are excellent at making tiles. They've been making tiles since the Roman, tile, Roman times and uh, using them so they know and it, they, they have areas where it's cold so their tiles are in. We had to, to do the test, okay? Same tests that uh, are done here, we had to get the tile. It was all part of the work. But we did and the, the, the tiles are excellent. And I tell you, they were like, just so you see the difference, uh, they were uh, roughly half, the cost was half the cost of the Ludovici tile. Ludovici wasn't very happy, but the, the difference was, I mean, I think there was a, I want to say, Eve correct me, because Eve was a project manager on, on this uh, project. I think they were like 45,000 tiles, am I right? I think it was 45 or 50,000, so it's a lot of tile, plus all the fittings. Okay, so the tile is being done. The trick in a tile roof like this is the lining of the roof. You have to see the, 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 the eave, the, the basis of the roof starts in many different areas. And, <clears throat> and then another, it starts in, in another place, like... Uh, 
right? It starts here, then it's a little higher there, and then something else comes. The trick is not to get confused, like you need to match the rows, they have to come together. When you get to the top, if you make a mistake, okay, you end up with what we call in French, you know, queue de billard, which is a, a billiard cue, right? Where it goes, you have a row, and it ends up with no row. And that doesn't work, you have to take the tiles down and go back further. So this is a tricky business. You have to go all around the roof and calculate your number of rows. Not easy, not easy. Okay, so more of the work, you know, turrets and all. A, a beautiful house. A round valley, look at the detail. All the tiles have to be cut um, and fitted. Nice fit on the hips there, right? And uh, okay, this house had also a lot of uh, metal work, lead work here, a detail, you know, other detail for the for the leaders, and that's existed before. We had to restore th some of that. That's lead, the done in lead by windows. Uh, oh, more in Turkey, sorry for the wrong. Finnish, Finnish house, uh, it, it was a name, it got an award for the architect and the, and the builder. Uh, these are with the addition of those two lead uh, cladded uh, windows. More of the work, more lead work. Got to work, we had to restore, rebuild that too. And I, this is the final picture that you get to see the whole roof. So that that's finishes the project that we're presenting to you. Um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. My <clears throat> Uh, we're going to have a time of a question, but I, I would like to say this, like for us, for me, I'm getting to a point where, so you've seen my colleague Eve here, there's two more that are sitting in the back, where are they? This is Julien over there, and Guillaume, and uh, you know, like me, I'm a, today, I, I'll give you that, today is my 65th birthday. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's a nice present. Your presence is a nice present. I'm really happy to do that. But for me, these are the gentlemen that will take over the business. And we work together. They love it. You can see I'm quite enthusiastic about the work. I love it. And they love it as much. And, you know, the, for, for our small company, is a company with a heart. We really put our heart in what we do. And we, we wish to train. Uh, that is the reason we exist. We, we would like to pass what we've learned to others. And, uh, and you know, restore, restore the New York patrimony. We're involved in really interesting projects and monumental cornices with grotesque and griffins and a lot of fun work. So we're excited about what's happening. But uh, yeah, we sure need help, qualified help, or people willing to learn. But uh, we're very happy, and thank you for your presence in uh, coming here and just being interested. Before we take questions, just a reminder that we are recording this presentation, so please wait for the microphone to come to you. The, the gray cupola dead ahead, is that lead? It's lead-coated copper. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's copper with a lead coating. Um, Thank you. So it's worked just the same way as copper, but it has the gray color. And lead-coated copper was really developed in the United States, I think at the turn of the century, where copper was used before, but you had all this staining, the green staining on the stone. And, and someone thought of 
coating with the lead, and then you still have some staining, but it's more of a grayish stain, and it, it doesn't, uh, you, you don't, you know, it's better for it goes the nicely with the terracotta look. And also, on the Park Slope project, the, the copper, um, what did you use for the hips on that? Did, did they overlap, or did you have tiles that were... Mm -mm. On the I'm hips, hard to explain. The, yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right. Uh, on the hips, for the there was the turret, and the, <clears throat> they the remember it's a copper roof, right, on the Park Slope uh, Church, uh, Saint Augustine. So the hips are also turned. The metal is turned with a double lock, pretty much the same way as it is done on the on the field panels. But it takes its all hand work then, because you cannot do that with the machine. Mm -hmm. So it takes more skill. And then the trick for the hips is that you have the, the vertical seams that come into the hips. So now you have, at times you have a, what would be like a six thickness of metal that you have to tie up in a roll. So you can remove some of it. I mean, there's, there's a way to do it. But the hips are rolled as well. Um, so, how long had this roof been in place, and what was failing about it? And how long are tiles like this expected to last, like in Turkey or wherever else they're used? So, the, 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 on, you're, you're speaking well, about this well, project, right? This, uh, well, this. It's, 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 it's a three-part question. Yeah. Um, this, did this roof fail prematurely, these tiles? I wouldn't say prematurely. I mean, the, and because of what reason? The the tile eventually, and they were original Ludovici tile. A number of the tiles scaled off, and uh, were crumbling. And so, how were they originally attached? So the tiles are attached with two nails, copper nails. As a slate roof might be. As a slate roof is. Sorry for I should have mentioned that, but yes, so the. The nail of choice is copper, sometimes stainless steel now. So how long might the, uh, this really substantial material, substantial looking material be expected to last? All right, a roof, a slate roof in, a, or a tile roof like this, I would say it depends on the quality of the material or of the slate. But on an average, you could say 75 years with up to 125 years. The material, the slate, or the tile could still be very good, but then the, the, the copper may fail or the flashing will fail. So, and then it becomes, you know, the tile, these tiles really, the filling of the tiles was they were scaling off and some were cracked. Leaks started, were, were beginning to be everywhere, and it didn't look, it looked damaged when you looked at the roof. The picture do not show it well, but you could see very different colors. And, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously it was time for a re-roof. So this is the roof of choice where it's used in that part of the world, but is it um, necessarily as, it's not maintenance free, is it? It's, this roof requires very little maintenance. I mean, the, the maintenance would be to keep the gutter clean and some maintenance in the gutter. And uh, I would say, okay, the part that will fail, for example, earlier than the roof would be, all right, this is wood right here. You're coming to a flat seam copper work where the copper meets the wood. You know, there's little, little um, reglet. This, and you use some coking now, which is much better quality coking that they used to have 100 years ago. But these are the, this where the, it will start failing. And leaks start happening. And eventually, really, the copper in this roof Correct me, but I, the, I think the copper was the cause of the leaks, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. That's, uh, these rules are truly remarkable. I had a question about uh, sources of slate, current sources of slate. The first or second house you showed, the one in Sag Harbor that was a, a big mansion that became a school and then a rich person bought it. The slate tiles, the, um, the replacement tiles, did they all come from one source and do you have to go to one quarry so that you get a uniform color? In other words, you can't change quarries. So you have to be sure that of a correct source before you start the job, correct? You're correct, absolutely. And where, where are some sources of good tiles these days? I understand Pennsylvania is a good source, or Vermont. I, 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 uh, I'm stopping you right there. Pennsylvania, am I not crazy about the Pennsylvania slate? I see. It changes color, it, it turns, you see a lot of uh, that slate turns white, gets I a see. whitish tone. I would say Vermont, of course, is, is the main source uh, of slate in the United States. And some uh, Virginia, some in Virginia, the black slate, mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's getting scarcer or harder to quarry. But some very good uh, black Virginia slate. I see. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take three more questions. Excellent uh, presentations. I have uh, two questions mainly. Uh, number one is all the projects that you've shown, you've replaced some uh, roofs that were, say, 100 years old. When you remove the existing tiles, slates, whatever the uh, materials were, did you find underlayments underneath the, the tiles on the deck substrate, number one? And number two, most of the pictures that you showed was um, you went back with a granular surface kind of underlayment. Um, that was my first part of the question. Second part was uh, the, the copper. You have uh, some copper that patinas brown and then copper that has a green patina. What was uh, your method used to uh, make the new copper patina green? Um, yes, when we do uh, remove the um, existing roofs, uh, there always is uh, an existing uh, underlayment. Um, it, it's still used today. Uh, it's the 30-pound um, um, uh, felt paper which has been in use for over a uh, hundred years, maybe? Yes, although a hundred years old, at least, probably. Right, but what happens is uh, they, they slowly turn to dust, and uh, if you would have leaks in the roof, uh, eventually that underlayment fails, and uh, yeah, you need a new roof and a new underlayment. Uh, why we use the uh, granulated here, um, well, this, this was an existing house. Uh, the interiors were, were very valuable. Uh, we could not afford to have any leaks at any time. It had to go through maybe one or two winters with storm, heavy rain, uh, no matter what, no leaks. And uh, this uh, heavy quality um, underlayment uh, allowed us to guarantee uh, uh, a leak-free project while the renovation was ongoing. Uh, two questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, maybe the question uh, on the copper. Um, the, uh, the green patina, you, you, you can uh, match, you can turn new copper into green using, uh, there are chemicals out there, you, you, can, you can match it. It, it. it is tricky, it is not easy. Uh, it takes a little bit of experience, but but uh, uh, I think we got it. We we know now how to do it, and uh, yeah, as you seen in the picture, you you can change some parts and some parts of the original, but once you're done with it, it looks like um, like it was like that all originally. So yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, what is the relative cost structure of the different types of materials? Uh, and, and number two, what kind of uh, uh, construction permits were necessary to, w were there any extra special problems that you had to go through to get permits? Can you answer 
question. <coughs> the, the, your question, the first one was the, did you say cost well, structure? Cost, uh, so if, uh, your, your slate costs, uh, you know, a sure. dollar per square foot or something like that. Uh, sure. The, the other material would cost 50 cents. How, how does mm -hmm. that work? Well, the, the cost structure, I would say, of course, it, it, it depends, all right, like a slate, for example, depends on thickness. It starts with the thickness, the size of the slate, uh, the thinner, uh, say, a medium-sized slate is probably your least expensive slate. I wouldn't say cheap because there's not, none of that stuff is cheap, really. But, if, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's reasonable. And the thicker you get, like when you get to like a stone, I, I, and you know what, time goes so fast, I didn't go over the stone roof, but a stone roof, you could say a thick slate is a stone roof. There's different kind of, we've done an interesting project which was uh, done with bluestone which is an, uh, about one inch thick to inch and a quarter. But so this, this product becomes you know, expensive because uh, the thicker, there's more material, right? And on a slate of a one inch thick slate, uh, since you can, a good slate, you can split it and they can make four slates of a quarter inch thick. So tells you tells it to you. Of course, there's less labor. You only have to split it once to get a one inch slate, but uh, you know, in general, I'd say they're, they're, they're expensive roof. That's why you see them on, on the national uh, buildings uh, or, or people that have means because, of course, like what, what would be the point of spending money there? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, rebuilding a house. For, for, for myself, I'm using asphalt shingle. I just can't afford the... <laughs> so. So, yes, thank you. Um, all right, for us, we're, we're usually, most of the work that we do will be for a general contractor. And once in a while, we get uh, an owner directly. Normally, when you do a re-roof, and of course, in New York City, it's, it, you have to go through the Landmark Commission, and there, it, 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 to get the permit, the permit process is more involved in the city. But say in the Hamptons or in Greenwich, you are allowed to re-roof, and, and if you re-roof in, in very much the same fashion that it was, you, you don't have to go through a complicated process. All right. If you change, though, and you don't have the permission, I, I think you, you, know, you could run into trouble. That has not happened to us. Right. This will be our final question of the evening, and I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunity for informal questions afterwards. Hello, my question relates to something we, we constantly hear here is, is the availability of skilled craftsmen and in the, in the traditional crafts. Last week we had Jean Riad from LMC here. You have also, I assume, are from the same guild possibly in France. Right, and, different trade, but okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, so you know, my question is what could be done here in this city, maybe not the entire United States, where we have a tremendous demand with all these historic buildings and there's really no place for people to learn the practical skills of the traditional arts. I'm not talking electrical work or plumbing, but tradesmanship in artisan work. Well, you, you, you really are putting your finger on, on even the very reason why we, why we came here. As, you know, the opportunity came is because we are in search of people interested in learning this trade. They're old, but they're, they're relevant, really. Um, I'm not sure what, this, what is the right way to go about it. I mean, my idea, you know, we recruit in, uh, like we're on the East End, now we're in the city. It's, it is difficult. My idea is to possibly recruit in uh, different schools uh, and uh, try to have a, a selective process, because it's difficult for lack of time. I did not address this, but for us, we come, we come from so Europe, and the idea of a trade, we call that in French a métier, is, uh, 
it's kind of uh, ingrained in us. We come from that tradition, and it's it's respected over there. It's seen differently here. It's more people people working with us. Some are very good, but they see the work as a job. It's a job. They're jobbing. They're, it's a job. I, I was a roofer. I was. It, it's a job that they did. And then if they get more money offered to do something completely different, they might just take that job. Because for them, they, they don't have the, necessarily the, the interest in learning a trade. We are, that you're, you're correct, we are training and we're trying to network and see and connecting with this, this is a really wonderful organization. I didn't know it, you know, why I, I'm interested, I, but, but this is great. I know there's a school of the building arts in Charleston, that I've, I've had a connection with that. Uh, so there are, yes, there are, things are happening. But uh, I think it's culturally, the, there is a difference in, I find it the, the, the main motivation, the idea of the love of work well done, which is what we promote, the culture of our company, is to develop that love of work well done. It's difficult. Culturally, there's more the, the love of money would tend to come first, okay? So that's the challenge, or one of the challenges we face. Vincent and Eve, um, thank you both so much for that fantastic presentation. And we so appreciate how you truly, again, celebrated artisanship. You highlighted how important um, teamwork is. It was amazing to see the, the skilled work on your, on your many different projects and also the fact that you talked about so, so what is so important, which was also highlighted in our lecture last week, the transmission of the artisan skills. And we are so delighted that you could be here with us this evening. So thank you so, both so much and especially on your birthday, Vincent. That's extremely oh. kind of you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, we would like to make a presentation to you both, and to do so is our executive director, Victoria Dengel. Okay, let me just. Okay. So, and and I, I I would like to add to Karen's comments. Thank you for your your passion, your commitment, your your beautiful work, and for sharing it sharing it with us. And we all we all learned so much. Uh, once again, we'll never look at a roof in the same way. And so, um, again, we're very grateful. And anybody who's been to these lectures know that, well, I, we are the stewards of a building that's 1890 construction. So, and it really is a good building and it, it doesn't give us much trouble, I have to say, knock on wood, okay? <laughs> but we always think of the craftsmen who built the building. I have to say, just about every day we think, Thank you for doing such a great job and giving us a structure that lasts. So, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 17, 1785, we express our gratitude to Eves Thenuis, TRM Enterprises, Master of Artisan, Master Artisan of Slate, Tile, and Stone Roofing, for his participation in the General Society Artisan Lecture Series. So, thank you very much. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, well, first of all, I think because it is your birthday, we really, I'm big on singing happy birthday. So, <laughs> come on, he did it on his birthday. So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Vincent. Happy birthday. Yay! Thank you so much. That was really wonderful, brother, and what a precious gift. Thank you.
Thank you so much. So on, be, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Vincent Leo of TRM Enterprises, master artisan of slate, tile, and stone roofing, for his participation in the General Society Artisan Lecture Series. Thank you so much. Thank there you. Very happy nice. birthday. Very special. Thank you, thank you. It was wonderful to oh. be here. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. All right, well, I'm glad you said that because <laughs> you're both um, honorary lifetime members of the library, so you'll come oh, back and you. visit us, please. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and so, finally, um, well, as we wrap up this evening, we would like to present you with a little memento of the night. And we also have a, a general society bag for you both. Well, yeah, you. Yes. So, so thank, in, you. thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. So in conclusion, a, a huge appreciation for sharing your skill and expertise with us tonight. It's been a very fitting conclusion to our artisan lecture series and we've been delighted that you've been part of it. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening and I hope you will now join us for a glass of wine and I'm sure our speakers would be delighted to answer a few more questions. Thank you so much.